Good morning, good to uh, be with you all. And uh, for those of you online, bless you. We're finishing our series on uh, being more like Jesus. And I trust you've enjoyed uh, the series that we've been doing, um, going through particularly just the wisdom uh, of the book of James and applying that to our relationships. How can we be more like Jesus? And we're finishing today talking about extending Jesus' mercy, being merciful like Jesus. Relationships are difficult. We're not going to beat around the bush. Relationships are tough. It'd be nice if they were easy. Um, You know, if by the click of a finger or a switch of a button that we could fix relational problems. Uh, But life is not like that. When our our relationships are good, uh, they're great. And... uh, But when there's disagreement or dysfunction, it can hurt. And uh, and so it happens in a range of our relationships, whether it's with family members. My goodness. Uh, We could probably all uh, tell a few stories about the people who they love us the most, but man, they can hurt us the most as well. We know how to push each other's buttons, don't we? Or maybe it's with friends. People that you think, hey, my best buddy, my BFF, they've got my back. But uh, again, oh, how we can, can hurt each other. Look, it might be work colleagues or fellow students if you're at school, university. You've got to turn up each day and see that person that, you know, said that or did that. Maybe it's your neighbours. Everybody needs good neighbours, don't they? with a little understanding and uh, nothing like that uh, program from Channel 10. I'm not going to ask anybody to put their hand up who watched the last episode this week. All I'm going to say is I'm disappointed they didn't bring Bounce of the Dog back. I mean, that, that would have been something. The irony of, of a soap opera, which creates drama out of nothing, is you've got this theme tune, and not even the dulcet tones of Barry Crocker singing about how wonderful neighbours are can, can change the fact that five seconds into the show, they're all lying and cheating and backstabbing each other, and they are the worst neighbours in the world. When there's conflict, our natural response is one of two things, is to either fight if somebody, you know, attacked you, either physically or verbally, the immediate response in us is usually, oh, I'm going to punch you back with, with a verbal punch. Or flight is to go, ah, I'm not hanging around for this, I'm going in the opposite direction, and we get out of there. But what about Jesus' response? Jesus' response is maybe counterintuitive, But if you look throughout the scriptures, when Jesus was confronted, and he was on many occasions, he stood his ground. He didn't turn around and run in the opposite direction. But particularly in circumstances where people might have showed anger or aggression or offense towards him, he showed love and mercy and compassion and forgiveness. He spoke the truth in love. Even in situations where he was talking to the Pharisees, and you might see some righteous anger coming out in in Jesus, you know, that pressed Jesus' buttons because he saw how unmerciful the Pharisees were, that they were caught up in their laws and rules, and that they didn't demonstrate mercy to others. And so, yes, relationships are difficult, but if we Follow Jesus. It's a simple piece of advice. If we follow Jesus, we're on very safe ground. So how do we do it? Let's have a look at Jesus' uh, example. Because the first thing to note is that Jesus has been merciful to us. He is the greatest example of mercy. And so we can learn from Jesus' mercy towards us. Jesus came to earth to be merciful. Um. Quite often as I'm uh, uh, 
falling asleep at night, I, I listen to music on YouTube, and I click on the random things. I don't even know what I'm, what music I'm, I'm listening to, and uh, and then I'll wake up in the middle of the night and I'll hear a song and go, wow, what is that? Fantastic, and not terribly helpful for staying asleep, but uh, uh, and on occasions I've I've found these fantastic songs, and this one in particular. Uh, I woke up in the middle of the night hearing these words and uh, we, we sang it at our Easter services earlier this year. And I love this song because it's called What Your Mercy Did For Me. It outlines exactly what, what Jesus did for us. And I'm going to share the words with you now. It says, I was hopeless. I knew I was lost. Death and darkness were my only songs. I needed someone to come rescue me, and mercy heard my plea. You gave me beauty for my guilty stains, and now I'm living day to day by your grace. So excuse me if I can't contain my praise, because I know that I've been saved. And Lord, you found me. You healed me. You called me from the grave. You gave me your real love. I thank you, Jesus. You washed my sins away. Now I'm living. Now I'm forgiven. You came to set me free. That's what your mercy did for me. That is what Jesus did for each and every one of us. Gave us hope. Rescued us from sin and death healed our hearts, showed us love, demonstrated forgiveness. And those are the things that we have opportunity to do and extend to others. Because Jesus gave us hope, hey, we can share hope with others. We can point them to Jesus. And certainly by the things that we say, and, and in restoring relationships, we can heal people's hearts, show the love, demonstrate the kind of forgiveness that we've been shown. So in the same way that Jesus showed mercy to us, we have to show mercy to others in resolving relationship issues. The first thing I want to share with you today is that if we, if we don't follow the Jesus model, if we hold on to things, it only affects us. And so where there's unforgiveness, in relationships, those things build barriers. Unforgiveness builds barriers. Unresolved issues build barriers. And sometimes you might feel really justified. Sometimes people, someone may have really hurt you. And you kind of think, well, you know, I'm not going to forgive them for that, or I don't feel like forgiving them. I want to hold on to this this feeling because they shouldn't have hurt me that way. She said this, he did that. But unforgiveness only diminishes us as people and hurts us if we hold on to it. Several years ago, we had a, a pastor, a guest preacher came and uh, speak. His name was Wayne Cordero. Had a had a church in Hawaii. How many of you would like to have a church in Hawaii? Does it sound like a good place to have a church? And uh, and he was a, a beautiful man, great preacher. And I will never forget the illustration that he gave us in terms of unforgiveness. He said some people have. Uh, he said, do you have a Velcro heart or a Teflon heart? He said people with Velcro hearts is like, you know, Velcro, everything sticks to it. Um, and so that's what people's, some people's hearts are like. If there's been an offence caused, any little word that's said, Ugh, it just sticks and they won't let it go. It just stays there. But Teflon, Teflon is the coating they put in like fry pans so that you can easily get your egg out or whatever. If your heart is Teflon coated, it's like when somebody throws in a bomb or says something to hurt you or does something that hurts you, yeah, there's probably a bit of a, a bit of pain there, but you don't hold on to it. It just whoop, slips straight off and goes. And, and Wayne said to us, don't hold on to bitterness and unforgiveness. Be Teflon coated with your heart. You know, just like Adam and Eve 
who were in the garden, they became separated from God because of their sin. And not just them, but that set a, a pattern for humanity. There was a barrier, there was a separation there between God and his people. But Jesus came to cross that great divide and to make a way. And so in the same way, we have to find ways to cross the divide, the barriers that, that, that are there. Now, I don't want to sound superficial about this either because sometimes when people cause pain and hurt, um, you know, we can't just easily f- forget those things and move on. Boundaries in relationships are a very healthy thing. So you can love someone, you can forgive someone and say, look, I love you, I forgive you, but we're drawing a line in the sand here. We're not going to cross that again. Nothing wrong with boundaries and putting sometimes a little bit of space and allowing time for healing in relationships. But barriers, when we build a wall, that just blocks people out. That just says, no. Who here remembers the Berlin Wall? Some of you were around the late, uh, ni- uh, late 1980s when the wall came down. A few of you may have been around when the Berlin Wall went up. Um, it was in the aftermath of World War II. And, uh, and Germany was a broken country. And I, the, the short version of it is there were people pulling in different directions. Some people felt that the country should be led one way, some people felt it should be led uh, another. And so in 1961, it came to a point where the east and west sides of Germany said, no, we don't want to relate to each other. They built a wall, a physical wall. But it wasn't just a physical wall, really it was, it's an ideological wall as well. It was a message saying, Now, we don't want to have relationship, we don't want to connect, we don't want to communicate, we're putting a barrier in place. And it was equally a statement when they knocked the wall down. And I can remember scenes uh, in in 1989, people um, celebrating and and, uh, you remember jumping up and down on the wall, they were just so excited this wall was coming down. Because again, it puts out a message, hey, we're building bridges, we're reconnecting, we're, we're trying to restore what was lost. And so we need wisdom and mercy when it comes to breaking down walls. Let's have a look at what James says in chapter 3. And reading from verse 13, it says, If you're wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honourable life doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. Man, how we need humility in relationships. Because guess what? Rarely is it just one person at fault (laughs) when there's an argument or disagreement. One person may have erred more than the other, but usually it takes two to tango, right? And so we have to own up to our own faults. Nothing um, you know, is more healing than saying, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. He goes on, wherever there's jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. Wow, that's pretty clear, isn't it? But, but it's an interesting statement. Jealousy and ambition are not always actually clear things to see, and they're even harder to point out when you may be resolving issues. They're indicators of the condition of our hearts. But the wisdom from above, the wisdom that we need from the Lord is, first of all, pure. It's perfect. We can rely on God's wisdom. It's also peace-loving. It's gentle at all times. It's willing to yield to others. That's an interesting word, yield. It means to kind of put put some of the junk and the the distractions to one side, the agendas, issues, and say, okay, let's work on our relationship. We're not going to try and fix every single... You know, sometimes in in relationships, we're going to sit down and talk about everything, try and fix every little problem. Life is not like that. And so we're we're willing to, to perhaps yield, especially on the things that aren't important. You've got to weigh those things up. 
What does he say? It's full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It's what we would want others to do to us. We would want people to be merciful to us. And so if we're going to be merciful... We have to practice what Jesus preached. Jesus certainly practiced what he preached. <laughs> and some of it, you might read it and go, like I said, it's counterintuitive. When you, you read some of the statements that Jesus made, you think, how on earth could I possibly do that? Like they're pretty challenging. And yet with his help, we can. Have a look at this. This is from Luke chapter six. This was Jesus preaching to a crowd but to those who are willing to listen I say love your enemies that's hard do good to those that hate you that's even harder if someone is (laughs) displaying hate towards you or spreading malicious untrue gossip about you and man try doing good to those people Bless those who curse you. How many of you have ever been in a road rage situation? <laughs> and somebody, they might start winding down the window and sending messages and waving unusual hand signals and all sorts to get your attention. And you think, you know, just, just letting off steam and anger. It's unbelievable. And you think, what have I done wrong? Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. I mean, that one's, we're getting into the nitty gritty now. If someone throws a bomb, says something, does something to hurt, the impulse, again, is not to uh, always to pray, but that's what Jesus says. Pray for those who hurt you. Now we're getting down to the, the tough stuff. If someone slaps you on one cheek, offer the other cheek also. I mean, this often comes up is one of the hard sayings of, of Jesus. It's counterintuitive if someone either physically gives you a smack on the cheek or more likely verbally dishes something out. There might be a little bit of truth in it, but sometimes it can be full of prickles and stings and, and it's unpleasant. Intuitively, we don't want to say, okay, well, come on, you know, insult me some more. But what Jesus is saying here, do you know what? I think in the context of relationships and working this kind of thing through, if someone throws in a bomb, offer the other cheek and say, you know what? That's true. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Is there anything else that, you know, I've caused offence? Open that invitation. And it might hurt. It might, you might hear things you don't want to hear. If it's not true, throw it out. Don't hold on to it. Let it fall off the Teflon-coated heart. But if there is some truth to it, take it on board. If someone demands your coat, offer their shirt, offer your shirt also. Give to anyone who asks. When things are taken away from you, don't try to get them back. Hey, they're only material things. Do to others as you would like them to do to you. Love your enemies, do good to them. And he finishes the passage by saying, you must be compassionate just as your father is compassionate. Wow. I read that and, and, and honestly, when I start to think about it, I think, ooh, that's a pretty high bar. I, I don't know if I could reach some of those things. And it does probably feel a little bit impossible But Jesus certainly demonstrated in his relationships, never more so than when he went to the cross and he was being physically abused, verbally abused. Um, And yet he didn't open his mouth once. He said it was like a, scripture says it was like a lamb to the slaughter. He didn't say a word. And there are examples throughout history of, of people who, have not allowed bitterness and anger and rage to be their motivating force, but mercy and compassion. Um, I was reading again this week the story of Nicholas Winton. Some of you may have heard of him. 
during World War II, Nicholas Winton um, was so moved by mercy and compassion, he heard the stories of what was taking place in Germany, that women and, and children were being murdered in, in concentration camps. And he just was so moved by this, he wanted to be part of the answer. He wanted to do something to help. And so nobody told him to do it. Of his own um, initiative and finance, he went to Germany and he started rescuing children out of, out of Germany. Um, took them to England, put them with families. He never even told them his name because it would have been a, a risk if people found out who he was. And so he, he rescued some 670 children uh, out, of, out of Germany. Uh, not the only person that did it. There were, were others, and we know the stories. But the amazing thing about this man is that he never told a single soul. He kept it to himself. He wrote down the name of every child that he rescued, and he put them in a box, and he stuck them in the attic. And his wife, many, many years later, was, was cleaning up the, the attic, finds the box. She starts reading through this stuff. She realises what he did. What an amazing gift of, of mercy that was. And, uh, and so she got some help and they actually got some of the, the, the children, who are now adults, together. And you can see this on uh, YouTube. It's an amazing clip. I encourage you to go and have a look at it. This moment when, when the, the TV host of this, this show says, uh, we have Nicholas Winton with us tonight and tells a bit of his story. And then she says, is there anybody here who owes their life to Nicholas Winton? And half the audience stands up. Tears in their eyes. The opportunity to thank this man who saved their life. And that was just one man. An ordinary man who did something extraordinary because he was moved by compassion and mercy. He is the living embodiment of this verse in Romans 12, 21. Don't let evil conquer you. Sometimes it's so easy to be overwhelmed by what's going on, either in our personal world or in the world around us. And to be, all that does is, is lead to oppression. Nicholas Winton didn't look and, and, and become embittered um, by what the Nazis were doing. He didn't say, I'm going in there to fight the Nazis. No, he was moved by compassion. It says, don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Wow. That's a, that's a really easy way of saying love your enemies. <laughs> conquer evil by doing good. When you see acts of... Acts of the devil, really, when you see his hand at work, then be moved to do good, to be compassionate, to be loving and merciful. How do you live a mercy filled life? Well, Jesus has set the bar pretty high, but if we read in Colossians chapter 3, it helps us in how to outwork this. And I'm going to read a little bit from that now. It says, since you've been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honour at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. Okay, it starts with a mindset. Don't dwell on the things of earth. Like I said, those things become oppressive to you. I have seen people who, who might you know, watch the, the, the nightly news and just become overwhelmed with, with grief and hopelessness at what they see in, in the world. But we <laughs> have a hope in Jesus. And so when we think about the things of heaven, think about heavenly responses. What is it that you dwell on? What is it that, that you... Think about, like it says in Philippians 4, whatever's good, whatever's pure, whatever's righteous, think about those kind of things. Think about the kind of re responses that you can have in those situations. Think about the things of heaven. That's the first thing. And then he goes on, he says, so put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. There are earthly attitudes and earthly responses that lurk in us. 
And so when it comes to relationships, oh man, some of that ugly stuff comes out, makes it even worse. It's like heaping fire on fire and anointing what's already there. He says, have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person's an idolater. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still part of this world, but now is the time to get rid of anger and rage and malicious behaviour and slander and dirty language. Don't lie to each other. Don't lie to each other, for you've stripped off your old nature and all its wicked deeds. You actually have to take some of those old attitudes off, like an old jacket. I used to have this beautiful dark blue corduroy jacket, and I wore it well beyond its use-by date. <laughs> I loved it. I just loved the buttons on it, actually. And uh, towards the end, the lining was falling out. The, you know, the pockets had holes so big in them I couldn't put anything in them. It would just go straight through. And there came a time when I had to retire the jacket. That's what it's like with our, our old attitudes. We don't want to go around wearing old rags that are just about falling apart. Get rid of the old moth-eaten, dirty ones. And what do you put on? It says, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Put those things on. As you get up in the morning and you're preparing for your day, just as you would pick out your clothes and put them on, pick out the kind of responses and attitudes you're going to have as you walk through the day. Sometimes it's not easy. There, there will be things that are confronting. There will be difficulties. But if you have clothed yourself with mercy and kindness, humility, gentleness, if you make allowances for each other's faults, sometimes we're so quick to point out the faults in other people, aren't we? And it's like, well, you're doing this wrong and this wrong. And sometimes it's really niggly, pathetic stuff. Man, we've got to put that stuff to the side. Forgive anyone who offends you. Remember that the Lord forgave you, and so you must forgive others. So what do we do? We, we think about the things of heaven. We take off the old responses. We clothe ourselves with a mercy mindset. And the final part says, always be thankful. Let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Just as his message of mercy has filled our life, we can extend that mercy to others. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom that he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord. We are representatives of Jesus. And so again, as you get up in the morning, as you put on that mercy mindset, as you walk down the street, be conscious you are representing Jesus. As you talk to people throughout your day, you're representing Jesus. When they speak back to you, give the Jesus response. In other words, if we're representing Jesus, we don't want to misrepresent Jesus by getting in the way ourselves. Take off the old self, the old response, and put on the Jesus response. Remember what I said at the beginning? Relationships are difficult. I don't want to be superficial about that. And uh, and we have to work at them. But practice makes perfect. Perseverance builds character. And Jesus' example gives us great hope. And so there are some of you today, look, this week, you've had relational difficulties. You've had confronting conversations. Maybe someone has said or done something. And it's hurt you. It's, it's okay to acknowledge that. But... I believe that Jesus wants to operate his mercy through each and every one of us. That as we are more loving and merciful towards one another, um, not only are we restored in relationship, but we can walk more closely with Jesus together. And so there are some of you here today, hey, maybe you've never even 
thought about the fact that Jesus has shown mercy to you. Maybe that's been a, a revelatory thought this morning. If you need his wisdom and humility in demonstrating mercy to others, you can overcome that unforgiveness and and bitterness. There are some of you that maybe today as, as I've been speaking, you're thinking, oh, but you don't know what that person did or said. I just, I can't forgive. You can with Jesus' help. In the natural, we get it. You probably don't feel like letting it go. But with Jesus' help, you can. And let's pray that his presence always goes before us and makes a way for restoring relationships, not building up higher walls, but bringing the barriers down. Amen. Let's bow our heads in, a, in, in prayer. I'd like to lead you in prayer. Heads bowed, eyes closed. This can be a, a, an overwhelming message. And yet when we follow Jesus' example, we're on safe ground to be loving and forgiving and compassionate. Father, I thank you for the example of the Word. Thank you that you've shown mercy to us through your Son, Jesus, the greatest example of mercy. That Jesus, when you're there, on the cross, you were dying in our place. You're doing it for us so that we could be saved, so that we could be forgiven. And so Lord, we thank you for that today. Lord, I think of those here this morning, Lord, maybe you've never acknowledged that, who've never confessed their need of you. Lord, come into their hearts and life today. Father, I pray for others here who are facing relational difficulties, whether it's a family member with a friend. Maybe there's been things that have been said and done. Jesus, I just speak hope and healing over those things now. Lord, give us the right words to say, the right actions to do. May we be filled with your wisdom and your spirit in responding to others. Lord, help us to learn from these passages of Scripture today that we would be better imitators of you in this this area, Lord. Have your way, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Can we stand together? Tanya's going to lead us in a song in a moment and we've got time in this place today. I want to open up the front for a time of of ministry. Maybe there are things that have specifically resonated with you today and you're facing issues and you you need Jesus' mercy. Something in you is saying, yep, I need prayer for that. I need help for that. We would love for you to come forward and one of our, our prayer ministry team will be available to pray with you. Maybe there's other aspects that we've been talking about over the last few weeks. You, you want to be a better listener or, or you want to be a peacemaker or, or you recognise just the power that comes from allowing Jesus to fill your relationships and you need Him at work in your situation. You come forward for prayer as well. Maybe there is a, a, a healing need that you have or you wanna step in for someone else. We have time in this place today. Jesus has only good things. The Father has only good things for His children. And so let's respond to Him now and believe for Jesus to work in each and every situation. Tanya, you come and lead us now.